All right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our final session for public budgeting for this first summer session. Uh, as you know, our summer session number one ends on Friday, June the 30th, and so we are just about done, and this will be our last session tonight. What I have planned for tonight is I'm not going to keep you the entire time tonight. In the first half of class tonight, we'll talk about intergovernmental fiscal relations, and then that will round out all the material for the course. Then I'll do a quick wrap up of some of the most important topics that we covered over the past six weeks. And then I will give you the remainder of the session free so that you can work on your remaining assignments. You have two assignments that are left. You have Canvas essay number five. And in Canvas essay number five, you'll be looking at your city's tax structure and assessing its tax structure in terms of whether you believe it is a progressive tax structure or a regressive tax structure based upon some of the information we covered last week. And then the second part of your post, you will then be recommending another type of taxation that you think your city should use. So how progressive or regressive is your tax structure? And then what other type of tax do you recommend the city use in lieu of some of the taxes that it's currently relying upon? So that's Canvas essay number five. That's your fifth and final Canvas essay. And then as always, remember to reply to two of your classmates. So your Canvas essay number five and your replies to two classmates those must be done by midnight on Friday, June the 30th. And then your other assignment that is due is the final assessment. Uh, we took some time in our last class session to go through and talk about that final assessment. I took you through the five scenarios and the total of 10 questions on the assessment. We talked through them, so I think you have a good idea of what you're doing on that final assessment. But that final assessment then is also due this Friday by midnight. Now, again, as you're working on that final assessment, be as parsimonious and concise as you can be. Most of those questions you can easily answer in one to two paragraphs. And I think that will probably get the job done. You can certainly go beyond that if you think it is necessary. And I certainly won't stop reading after a couple of paragraphs, but uh, try and be as parsimonious and concise as you can be with your answers. And then that will round out all of our assignments for the class. All that comes in by midnight on Friday. I'll then spend the weekend going through the final grades. I'll calculate the final grades and then I'll have the final grades ready to go into the system if everything goes well by the end of the weekend. And that will then allow you to move onward and upward. If you have another class you're taking in summer session three, then this will be all over with and you can then focus on that class you're taking in the next summer session. So that is where we currently are at in the class. Uh, I have gone through all the Canvas essay number fours and I have provided some feedback. I think everyone did a nice job uh, providing the advantages and disadvantages of the different types of bonds. So thank you for those essays. I also went through and reviewed all the post-instructional assignments. I think they were all well done. If there were a couple of comments I had in terms of things that could have, be done, could have been done differently, I provided that to you in the feedback box, but I think all the grades were, were certainly in the A and high B range. And so I think everyone did a nice job on the, the post-instructional. Again, the primary goal of the post-instructional is just to afford you the platform for putting together a simple budget using Excel. And I would recommend that if you are not terribly familiar with Excel, you will have to use Excel in your budgeting case for 697. And so you will be required to put together a rudimentary budget for 697 case. So if you're not really familiar with um, Excel and inputting formulas and, and the like, then please do go and take a look at that tutorial that Dr. Moore put together. I have it linked on our Canvas site and watch some of those, those videos. I think those will be helpful. Okay. All right, any questions before we get into our final topic for the course? All right. Our final topic is to kind of round out our discussion of revenue. You know, the past week, the past couple of weeks, we have been looking at the revenue side of the equation. Last week, we talked about taxation, different sources of tax revenue, their advantages and their disadvantages and linked all those different sources of tax revenue back to our five evaluative criteria of taxation, burden distribution, 
equity, adequacy, collectability, and uh, economic efficiency. One thing to keep an eye on is I just saw a couple of days ago that the Supreme Court just accepted for review a case that I believe is called Moore versus United States. And in the Moore versus United States case, the court will be chiming in on what is considered to be income for the purpose of taxation. Now, Congress has nearly unfettered access to taxing income. And with the 16th Amendment that was ratified in 1913, the 16th Amendment says that Congress may levy taxation on income from whatever source, or from any source whatsoever without apportionment. The question is in this US, this Moore versus US case is can governments, especially the federal government, can the federal government tax the increase in value in foreign holdings if that increased value has not yet been realized by the investor. And this became a germane issue with the Tax Cuts and Job Act under the Trump administration back in 2017 that greatly expanded the ability of the national government to tax increases in foreign holdings and foreign investments. And so that's being that part of the law is being challenged in terms of if your the value of your investment in a foreign holding increases, but you don't cash that out and you don't realize that money, it's just the values increase, but you don't actually have access to that money, does that constitute income? And obviously, the plaintiffs in the case are saying that they should not have to pay their $14,000 tax bill because they never cashed in that equity in that foreign holding. And the federal government uh, is saying that under the 2017 Act, that that does count as income. So just kind of the dovetail of what we talked about last week, this is another example of how tax law does have a tendency to change. It's ever evolving. It's a very dynamic type of concept. And so keep an eye on what the Supreme Court says in terms of this case of Moore versus the United States to see if it expands the definition of income or if it keeps the def definition of income as narrow as it always has been, which is income is income whenever it is realized, whenever people actually get that money, at that point is when it is considered income and then can be subject to federal income taxation. I think we all probably have a good idea of where the court's going to go and what direction the court will lean to in that case. But it's just another example of how it's very fluid in terms of our tax law and how we generate revenue uh, at all levels of government. So that's why I mentioned that to you. It's kind of a current event that really influences what we were talking about last week. But tonight, what we will do is we will turn our attention to another source of revenue for state and local governments, namely intergovernmental revenue. And more broadly tonight, we'll talk about intergovernmental fiscal relations, the financial relationships between the three different levels of government. Now, if you're very interested in this information, intergovernmental fiscal relations, I do recommend that uh, we have an intergovernmental relations course that is offered every summer. Uh, I know one or two people from this class are also in that intergovernmental relations course. So if you are interested in that topic, we do have that course offered every summer session one, and it might be something you might want to consider as an elective next summer. But before we get into a discussion of intergovernmental fiscal relations, I think that there are some basic principles that we need to understand and kind of get on an even playing field in terms of our understanding of what these core principles are. So in my mind, there are three core principles that really underpin intergovernmental fiscal relations. Some of these principles argue for a further decentralization of power and authority between the three different levels of government. Some of these principles argue in the opposite direction and argue for more of a centralization of authority and power. The first principle that underpins intergovernmental fiscal relations is this principle known as the correspondence principle. The correspondence principle says that those governments and those individuals who are most impacted by a policy or a program should be the same ones who are involved in the decision-making for that policy or that program. 
in essence, correspondence says that the impact should correspond with the responsibility for making the decisions, and sometimes the responsibility for paying for those decisions that are being made. The correspondence principle argues for decentralization of decision making, and so it argues for a further fragmentation in our American federal system. A second principle that underpins federalism kind of writ large worldwide is this concept known as subsidiarity. I know it's kind of a strange word, but it's called subsidiarity. And we need to understand that our system of federalism is not the only system of federalism in the world. We are just one of many systems of federalism. And each of those systems of federalism work differently. In our system of federalism, we typically violate this principle of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity says that parent governments, so for instance, the national government, has a responsibility to provide the resources necessary for state and local governments to carry out the actions that are being demanded by the national government. So the national government tells the state government, you must um, test for this type of pollutant in your water. The cost of that test should then be paid for by the national government because it's a national mandate, a national order that's being placed upon these states. Subsidiarity really deals with the idea of devolution of power and authority. So the correspondence principle talks about decentralization allowing state and local governments a seat at the decision-making table. Subsidiarity talks about providing them with the resources necessary to then carry out those decisions. And that's the difference between decentralization and devolution. Decentralization, allow participation in the decision-making process. Devolution, providing the necessary resources to actually implement and carry out those decisions. Now, as I said, in American federalism, we routinely violate the subsidiarity principle. And we routinely violate that principle through the use of unfunded and partially funded mandates. And later on tonight, we will talk about what mandates are and different examples of mandates and the fiscal impacts of mandates on state and local governments. But essentially, if the federal government issues a mandate, an order to tell a state or local government to take a certain type of action, and then does not fully fund that mandate, that is a violation of this subsidiarity principle. Other federal systems around the world tend to do a bit better job in maintaining this subsidiarity principle. Uh, Australia comes, comes to mind, the Australian system of federalism. Typically, whenever the national government has regional governments do things, the national government usually, if not fully funds, at least very close to fully funds those requirements for those regional governments. So subsidiarity is something we don't do all that well in our system of American federalism. So correspondence argues for decentralization of decision making. Subsidiarity argues for a devolution of resources carrying out those decisions possible. The third principle is economies of scale. And you're familiar with economies of scale from your microeconomics course. With economies of scale, we are talking about doing things together, that if we buy things in bulk and we, we purchase things in volume, that we can do so at a much lower cost than if each individual local government or each individual state government went out there and made those purchases on their own. Economies of scale says that it is much more economical for us to act in concert at the larger level of government. So if the national government does it, the national government will be making larger pur purchases and then we'll get a, a larger discount for those purchases, as opposed to then allowing all these tens of thousands of local governments to go out there and make these purchases on their own. Economies of scale is different, obviously, from the correspondence principle and from subsidiarity, because economies of scale argue in the opposite direction. Rather than arguing for a decentralization devolution of power in our system of federalism, economies of scale will argue for centralization, to centralize decision-making, to make it cheaper, and to reduce the marginal costs of those decisions that we are making. 
So the reason why I mentioned these three different principles is that we will see these three different principles play out as we talk about our different types of grants and aid, as well as we talk about our different types of mandates. And it really does underscore for us the tension that is inherent within our system of American federalism. Federalism is a dynamic concept in that the proper balance of power and responsibilities between our three levels of government will shift, and it depends upon a variety of different factors. It'll depend upon which party controls Congress. It'll depend upon which party controls the presidency. Most notably, it will, it will depend upon the majority in the Supreme Court, and especially in the, the federal, court, federal judiciary that if we have a conservative leaning Supreme Court like we have now, we oftentimes expect to see more deference to states' rights. If we have a more liberal leaning court, then we tend to see more deference to national power and a national approach to making and implementing decisions. And so we've seen this ebb and flow throughout the history of American federalism. And sometimes we trend more toward decentralization at other times, we trend more toward centralizing decision-making in Washington, D.C. As kind of beyond the, the scope of this class for us to get into the specifics of how federalism has evolved over the past 200 plus years, if you take the intergovernmental relations class, we will go through all the different eras of federalism. And we'll talk about uh, the era of dual federalism up until the Civil War. And then we'll talk about competitive federalism when national and state governments were competing with each other for what duties and functions they get responsibility for. Um, we'll talk about co cooperative federalism with the response to the Great Depression and how the federal government started bailing state governments out with a lot of these grants and aid programs to help them deal with the Great Depression, uh, a much more decentralizing type of an approach. Uh, we'll talk about an era such as coercive federalism, where we centralized power in Washington, D.C., and believe that it really was up to Washington, D.C. to try and close the gaps in disparities in wealth between different Americans uh, in terms of Johnson, President Johnson's war on poverty and his great society. Uh, we'll talk about eras such as the new federalism of the Nixon and Reagan administrations, where we, again, bounce back to decentralization and devolution and turning functions and decisions over to state and local governments. So it's a very dynamic concept. And at certain points in time, we use very stringent centralizing tools, such as direct order mandates. At other points in time, we will use much more generous, if you will, tools such as block grants to afford state and local governments a lot more flexibility and latitude in making their decisions on how to implement their policies and their programs. But again, if you're interested in that, that's something we really get into in the intergovernmental relations course. For this course, though, we're looking at intergovernmental relations within a relatively limited perspective, looking in terms of intergovernmental fiscal relations. And that's kind of how we're going to constrain our, our discussion tonight. But to understand intergovernmental fiscal relations, how the three different levels of government interact with each other through finances, we have to first understand the constitutional basis of American federalism and intergovernmental relations. And it is important that we distinguish between the terms constitutional federalism and intergovernmental relations. Constitutional federalism speaks to the relationship and the balance of power between the national and state governments. When you read through the Constitution, which I, I hope you did in 500, I know if you had 500 with me, uh, that's one of the things we do in every single 500 class as we read through the Constitution, you know that in the Constitution, the only two levels of government that are discussed are the national and state governments. Local governments are not mentioned in the US Constitution. They do not have any constitutional standing. Any protection that local governments get, they must get from state constitutions and from state laws. So when we're talking about constitutional federalism, we're talking about the relationship between national and state governments. When we include local governments into our discussion, that's when we move from constitutional federalism into the term intergovernmental relations. 
since in this class we are very interested in, in local finance and local budgeting, our focus is more on intergovernmental fiscal relations as opposed to fiscal federalism as you would if you're only looking at the two levels of government, national and state. So that's why we focus on intergovernmental fiscal relations. But if you, when you read the Constitution, you will see that the Constitution is a series of compromises. In order to get nine states to sign off on this Constitution, ratify this Constitution, and especially to get the state of New York to ratify the Constitution, the framers had to engage in a series of compromises in writing the Constitution. And some of the important compromises that have impacts on intergovernmental fiscal relations, you think about the compromises between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. So at the Constitutional Convention, you had the Federalists, people like James Madison. Alexander Hamilton was another Federalist. The Federalists believed in creating a stronger national government. They wanted to get rid of the Oracle's Confederation and create a constitution that created a strong national government. The other faction you had were the Anti-Federalists, led by people like Sherman. Uh, and the Anti-Federalists really believed in states' rights. They liked the protection of states' rights that they found in the Articles Confederation, so they didn't want to replace the Articles. They just wanted to strengthen them so that we had better national defense. And we won't get into the whole historical discussion of Shays' Rebellion and how that all came about. But the Anti-Federalists believed more in states' rights. Federalists believe more in a stronger, more vibrant national government. So in order to get both sides to agree, we had to build a lot of compromises into the Constitution. And you can see that in terms of things such as Article VI Supremacy Clause when balanced with the Tenth Amendment in the Bill of Rights. So in Article VI of the Constitution, the Constitution has a very strong proclamation of national government supremacy. It says that the Constitution and the laws and the treaties of the United States are the supreme laws of the land, meaning that whenever a state constitution comes into conflict with the national constitution, the supremacy clause would lead us to believe that the national constitution will win. When state laws come into conflict with national laws, the supremacy clause would lead us to believe that national laws win out over state laws. So that supremacy clause in Article 6 is a very strong proclamation of national government power. Obviously, anti-federalists were very concerned that this created too strong of a national government and eroded states' rights. So immediately, in order to get this constitution ratified, as you all know from your history courses, we had to add 10 amendments immediately to the constitution in the form of the Bill of Rights. And the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution is known as the Reserve Powers Amendment. And it says that powers that are not given to Congress are then reserved for the states and or the people. So if a power is not specifically given to Congress, given to the national government, then those powers that are not given to the national government in the Constitution should then be reserved for the states. So you can kind of see that you've got this duality here, a centralizing approach with the Supremacy Clause and a decentralizing approach with the Tenth Amendment. Another example of kind of this push and pull between centralization and decentralization comes from Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. If you remember your 500 class, Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution is the most detailed, most specific article of all seven articles in the Constitution. And Article I, Section 8 lays out the powers of Congress. In Article I, Section 8, most of it is devoted to what we call the enumerated powers of Congress. Article I, Section 8 will list out, here are the specific powers that Congress has. Congress has the ability to coin money. Congress has the ability to levy taxation. Congress has the ability to raise an army. Congress has the ability to raise a navy. Congress has the ability to regulate commerce between the states. Con Congress has the ability to create post offices. All these are what we call the enumerated powers of Congress, and there are a lot more, but those are just some examples. When we enumerate powers, we are literally listing those powers. 
And when you list those powers, by definition, that limits the powers of Congress. Because the assumption, obviously, is if it's a power that is not listed there, if it's not enumerated in Article 1, Section 8, then that's a power that does not belong to Congress. So the enumeration of powers is really more in line with decentralization of power down to states and reserving powers for state government. However, as you know, when you read Article 1, Section 8, you get to the end of Article 1, Section 8, and you have this thing known as the Elastic Clause. Some people call it the Necessary and Proper Clause, that Congress shall make all laws necessary and proper for carrying the execution of the foregoing powers and all of the powers vested in it by the Constitution. In other words, Congress can do anything that it needs that it deems necessary and proper in order to carry out all of those powers that were enumerated earlier in Article 1, Section 8. Clearly, that elastic clause is much more of a nod to centralization and can be and has been used by Congress to then erode the rights of state governments. So even within just one section of one article of the Constitution, you can see this tension between centralization uh, that we see with the Elastic Clause versus decentralization with the enumeration of specific powers to Congress. But again, all this is done as a series of compromises to placate the anti-federalists, to get the anti-federalists to then support this new constitution. Why is that important? That is important because whenever Congress tries to expand its power over states, Congress will typically use two different devices. One device it will use is the elastic clause. It will say, well, we this is necessary and proper for us to do. So ordering a state to do this is necessary and proper for us to carry out our enumerated powers. And the second basis that Congress tends to use is this enumerated power that's known as the Commerce Clause, that Congress may regulate commerce between the states. So anytime Congress can link what they want to do with interstate commerce, they then have the power to then exercise that power over state governments. So the combination of the Elastic Clause, as well as the Commerce Clause, both from Article 1, Section 8, those are the two bases of power that the Congress typically has used when it has issued very restrictive mandates, such as direct order mandates, when it has required certain actions on the part of state and local governments in order to qualify for federal funding, those are the bases on which Congress usually expands its power over state governments. And so that's why it's important to our discussion of intergovernmental fiscal relations tonight. Last week, when we talked about taxation, we also gave a nod to this idea of, this idea of reciprocal tax immunity. And we said for many years, from 1819 up until the 1980s, there was this constitutional principle known as reciprocal tax immunity, which said that one level of government may not tax another level of government. And we had made mention, I believe, to McCulloch versus Maryland back in 1819, this very famous seminal Supreme Court case, whereby the state of Maryland was taxing the fiscal notes being issued by the Second Bank of the United States by its branch office in Baltimore, Maryland. Chief Justice Marshall, in writing the decision of McCulloch versus Maryland, said the power to tax is equivalent to the power to destroy. Therefore, the state of Maryland cannot tax the holdings of the national government. The national government cannot tax the holdings of a state government. Reciprocal tax immunity. That was a very important principle that underpinned intergovernmental fiscal relations for many, many years, all the way up until the 1980s. And then in 1986, we ended up with this Tax Reform Act. And in the 1986 Tax Reform Act, this is where Congress created the two different categories of debt, uh, private activity debt and public purpose debt, as we talked about when we talked about debt management a couple of weeks ago. Public purpose debt, the interest earned on that debt would remain tax exempt. Private activity debt may be subject to taxation. So the interest earned by investors on private activity debt could be subject to federal income taxes. So really kind of for the first time, you see the, the Congress saying, we can tax holdings and actions of municipal governments, of state and local governments. 
And the Supreme Court then reaffirmed the constitutionality of that two years later in 1988 in the case of South Carolina versus Baker that, again, we had talked about a couple of weeks ago. The importance here is that as a result of the Tax Reform Act and South Carolina versus Baker, reciprocal tax immunity is no longer a hard and fast principle of American intergovernmental relations. Reciprocal tax immunity exists as far as Congress wants it to exist. In South Carolina versus Baker, the Supreme Court essentially said that, essentially said that Congress had the ability to decide if it wanted to tax state and local holdings. And so that was a that ball was placed in the court of Congress. And Congress had the ability to decide whether or not to completely get rid of the reciprocal tax immunity. Reciprocal tax immunity is no longer really a constitutional principle anymore. Congress has not really gone out there and started taxing state and local governments. So at least in practice, it's still kind of around. But as a constitutional principle, there is no constitutional mooring anymore for this principle of reciprocal tax immunity. But again, it's important for us because it has a big impact on intergovernmental fiscal relations. It means that typically one level of government does not tax the holdings, the values, the property of another level of government. So that kind of gives us a constitutional basis for understanding intergovernmental relations and therefore intergovernmental fiscal relations. And what it tells us is because of the series of compromises that we have in the Constitution for intergovernmental relations, it means that, again, intergovernmental relations will be a very dynamic, very changing type of concept. As Congress and the national government tries to get state and local governments to accomplish national objectives, they need to, in many instances, induce or incentivize these state or local governments to accomplish national objectives. If Congress wants state and local governments to do something, and Congress does not have the constitutional ability, it's not one of Congress's enumerated powers, to straight up tell state and local governments to take a certain type of action, they then have to incentivize and induce state and local governments to take that action. And so one of the primary tools of intergovernmental fiscal relations that Congress uses, and state governments use the, for their local governments as well, is the use of grants in aid. And I would assume that many of you in your organizations, you have run across a variety of different grant programs. Some of you may be administering grant programs, but a grant and aid is essentially what we call the carrot approach for the national government to get state governments to do what they want them to do, and for state governments to get local governments to then try and get them to do what the state wants them to do. It's the carrot approach because it is the warmer, fuzzier, uh, softer approach to getting a subnational government to kind of do your bidding and to come in compliance with your goals and your objectives. Grant programs have been around for a very long time, but grant programs, especially federal grant programs, really started to pick up an in intensity in the FDR administration. And so you had the stock market crash in the 1920s, you then had the onset of the Great Depression. FDR is then elected to the White House in 1932. When he comes in the Oval Office in 1933, he then brings with him his New Deal programs, the creation of all these new agencies and all these new grant programs to try and help pull state and local governments out of the despair of the Great Depression. And that's when we saw this major proliferation of federal grants in aid. And that's where grants really became a very powerful and very common tool used by the national government. Now, when we look at grants and aid, there are different types of grant programs out there. And if we want to look at grants and aid in terms of kind of a, on a spectrum, there are three different main approaches to grant programs. On one end of the spectrum are what we call categorical grants. Categorical grants are very specific grants and aid for specific types of programs and for specific types of actions. If you are a state or local government and you are the recipient of a categorical grant, and some of you may work with categorical grants, 
you know that you will only be able to use that money for specific types of activities. There are only specific things that you can spend categorical grant money on. Not only are you limited in your ability to spend money, but you also held very accountable for how you are spending that money as well. There will be auditing requirements and you will be held to account to show the grantor, the national government, that you are spending this money in the way in which the national government has mandated that you spend that money. So it's a very specific type of grant program, categorical grants. At the other end of the spectrum, you have what was called general revenue sharing. General revenue sharing was literally a program whereby the national government would take a percentage of federal income tax revenue and then turn that money over to state and local governments with very few strings attached. To so take a percentage of federal income tax revenue, give it in grant money to state and local governments, and essentially tell state and local governments, you may spend this money in any way that you see fit. You don't have the same accounting requirements. You don't have the same auditing requirements. It's just literally turning federal income tax revenue over to state and local governments. So that's on the opposite end of the spectrum from categorical grants. So categorical grants, very specific, very restrictive. General revenue sharing, very broad and very general, afford a lot of flexibility and latitude to the recipient of that revenue. Then in between categorical grants and revenue sharing, you then have another type of grant known as a block grant. Block grants kind of split the difference between specific categorical grants and general revenue sharing. In a block grant, the federal government will provide this grant money to a state or local government to be spent within a general programmatic area for a general programmatic purpose. The specifics in terms of how the state or local government actually specifically spends that money will be left up to the recipient, to that state or local government. So as long as the state or local government is spending the money in a way that will further the goals of this program, they have the ability to spend the money how they see fit. So you know, example could be you have a federal grant program that is meant to try and um, educate at-risk youth. That's the programmatic goal. If it's a block grant program, then the local government when it receives that money can spend that money on maybe um, uh, computer literacy programs, uh, after school counseling programs, uh, maybe um, midnight basketball programs. They have a choice in how they spend the money as long as all of those programs will help accomplish the overall goal of educating at-risk youth. A great example of block grants came with welfare reform in the mid 1990s. It's with the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, otherwise known as welfare reform. We took a categorical grant, Assistance to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, and we replaced that very specific categorical grant with a block grant known as Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. With those block grants, state governments could then take that money and use that money in a variety of different ways in order to reduce their welfare rules. And to the ultimate goal was to move people from welfare into work. And so however they did it was up to those states. And so states, again, want to spend it on literacy programs, so want to spend it on childcare programs, uh, job you know, seeking programs, whatever they want to spend the money on, as long as it contributes to moving people from welfare to work, they had a lot of flexibility in how they spent that money. That's an example of uh, temporary assistance to family grants. That's an example of this type of a block grant. Block grants obviously are not new. They predated welfare reform. Block grants date all the way back into the 1940s and the 1950s. Uh, Ronald Reagan, when he was president, was a big believer in decentralizing and devolving power down to state and local governments. So what Reagan did is he took 187 categorical grant programs and he combined them together into 12 block grant programs, providing state and local governments with a lot more flexibility in how they spent the money. That was the good news for state and local governments when Reagan took 187 categorical grant programs and combined them into 12 block grants. The bad news was there was a trade-off. 
state and local governments got a lot more flexibility in how they spent the money, but in exchange, they got less money than they were getting in aggregate when they got those 187 categorical grant programs. So it's kind of a bittersweet pill for, for state and local governments to swallow. But it kind of gives you an idea of the different types of grants and where they sit on the spectrum from very restrictive categorical grants to very broad general revenue sharing to kind of the middle ground with these things we call block grants. Now, we talk about the spectrum from categorical grants to general revenue sharing, just kind of an illustrative type of approach because general revenue sharing is no longer around. General revenue sharing was initiated in the Nixon administration and it was abolished in 1986 by the Reagan administration. So we no longer have federal general revenue sharing. And the reason why Reagan abolished it was not that he disagreed with it. He agreed with the concept of giving a lot of flexibility and latitude to state and local governments. The problem was just a functional one in that we didn't have any revenue to share. Now, if you look at the federal budget, especially in the mid 1980s, we are running deficits and those deficits every single year were becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. So when you're running a deficit, your expenditures are exceeding your revenues, there's no excess revenue to share with state and local governments. And so that's why it was abolished by the Reagan administration in 1986. So today, what we typically tend to see is we tend to see categorical grants and block grants. The federal government will use categorical grants when it really wants to make sure that a state or local government is accomplishing a specific type of goal, when it wants to incentivize state and local governments to be more innovative and creative in how they are accomplishing a goal, that's when it will use more of a block grant type of variety. Whether governments are using categorical or block grants, this grant money can be distributed in a couple of different ways. Sometimes grant money can be distributed in terms of what's called a project type of grant. A project grant is a grant in which governments will compete for that grant program. So the national government will put out a request for grant proposals. And they'll say, here is a, a grant that we have for this purpose. And then we'll invite governments, state and local governments, to then apply for this grant. So the state and local governments would then write grant proposals. Those grant proposals would then be reviewed by the national government. And the government would then decide which of those state and local governments has the most uh, meritorious proposal and then those with the best proposals are the ones that will then get that grant funding. So in a project basis, those grants are being handed out in terms of a competition where governments will write proposals, submit those proposals to the national government. The other basis on which grants can be given out is on a formulaic basis, formula-based grants. Formula-based grants are grants such as what we typically see funding K through 12 education in many of our states, including here in the state of California. So in a formula-based grant, what you will do is you will take characteristics of that state or local government, and you will then put their characteristics into a formula. You'll work through the formula, and those state or local governments that fare better as a result of that formula are the ones that then receive more in grant money. So you think about foundation education types of formulas. Just about every state has a foundation formula that it uses to make sure that every local school district gets a minimum amount of money to operate on. And so what they will do with their formula is they will then put the characteristics of that school district into the formula. So things such as the uh, number of at-risk students, uh, what we call here in California, the unduplicated pupil population. So the number of students who are English learners, the number of students who are below the poverty level, uh, the number of students who have disabilities, the, the more unduplicated pupil population you have, the more money you will then get from the state in terms of education spending. That's a formulaic type of a basis. And so grants can be given on a project basis or a formulaic basis. If your purpose is to try and equalize spending, then you'll probably want to use a formulaic basis. If your purpose is to try and um, have governments compete against each other to try and get the best proposals, then you'll probably want to use a project basis for how you allocate those grants.
in a project basis approach, that's when we see a lot of local governments get into the process of grantsmanship, where they will hire grant writers to go out there and pursue as many grants as they can possibly pursue to get as much intergovernmental grant money as they can possibly acquire. Uh, sometimes there are opportunity costs associated with that, that if you're spending your money on these grant writers, yes, the grant writers are gonna bring in more grant money, but if this grant money is targeted to only be spent in a certain type of way, if it doesn't match the priorities of the local government, then you're kind of wasting your time and wasting your money. Another aspect of grants is whenever grants have what we call matching components. So some grants will come with federal matching components, whereby the national government will say, this program is so important to us that we will match dollar for dollar. Every dollar that a local government raises to spend on this program, we will then match it with $1 of federal money. Obviously, when you have a matching grant, you end up reducing the cost of that program for that local government. So sometimes these matching grants can actually distort the preferences of local governments. And so you go back to our capital budgeting discussion and our comparison of capital project versus capital project, the recreation center versus a senior center. We go and we do our cost benefit analysis and we calculate our benefit cost ratio for both of those projects. Then along comes the federal government and says, well, we really are, are making a push to see more senior centers. And so we're gonna match every dollar you raise with a dollar of federal money to pay for this senior center. Well, suddenly the benefit cost ratio of that senior center now looks a heck of a lot better than the benefit cost ratio of that recreation center. So even if the city was leaning toward the recreation center, once they get this matching grant offer, they're going to immediately go and fund that senior center because it's much less costly even if it is not the top priority of that local government. So just to underscore that some of the projects with grants, depending on how they are created, if they have matching components, they can distort local preferences. If they are project-based grants, they tend to have a problem with grantsmanship. Even formula-based grants tend to have a problem. And the primary problem with formula-based grants is that oftentimes the grantor does not go back and index the formulas. They do not go back and revise the formulas to reflect current situations. And so oftentimes in these formulas, there'll be what's called a cost of doing business factor. And so if you are a government operating in a rural area of the state, your cost of doing business will probably be lower in many respects than if you were operating in a metropolitan area. Well, some of those rural areas that were rural in the 1990s through development are now no longer rural, and they are now more metropolitan areas, but they're still being categorized as rural areas in that formulaic funding. And so if you don't keep up with changing conditions and, uh, and annually make those modifications and changes to your formula, then you're going to be rewarding the wrong governments, and you're not going to be having your money go where it is supposed to go. But grant programs are really the carrot approach. So you provide this money as an incentive to state and local governments to carry out whatever we want them to carry out to accomplish whatever goal or objective we want them to accomplish. Grant money tends to stick where it hits. And there's a very famous paper from many years ago by a person by the name of James Fawcett. And Fawcett wrote a paper about what he called the flypaper effect of grants. And his argument is that there is a flypaper effect that whenever federal grant money comes into a state or local government, even if there's some flexibility in how that money is to be spent, it typically sticks where it hits, meaning that you're not going to see local governments reduce their tax rate because they're getting more federal money. They're going to keep their tax rate the same, and this federal money is going to be looked at as um, above and beyond their normal revenue that they are generating because they don't know when this federal revenue is gonna go away. Grant revenue tends to be very transient. It tends to be relatively unpredictable. And those grant programs that you've gotten over the past five years may very easily go away if they're not reauthorized by Congress in the next congressional session. And so because of that uncertainty, usually you see that federal grant money just kind of stick where it hits. And it's nothing that you're gonna see um, supplanting own source revenue from local government. 
But that is the Karen approach, the softer, kinder, gentler approach to getting state and local governments to come into compliance with national goals and objectives. Then we have the stick approach. And the stick approach, the use of mandates. And you're probably familiar with mandates, especially if you work at the local level of government. Mandates are orders that are given by a parent government to a subnational government. So mandates that flow from Washington, D.C. to Sacramento or to Long Beach, California. Uh, sometimes we have state mandates that flow from Sacramento down to Long Beach. Those are orders coming from a quote-unquote parent government. Mandates are considered the stick approach because, again, they are an order that you must take this action. And oftentimes they are either partially funded or completely unfunded in nature. So they can have very profound impacts on the fiscal health of the uh, recipient of that mandate. Now, not all mandates are created equal, and there are different types of mandates that parent governments may use. One type of mandate, a very simple type of mandate used by a parent government, is what's called a direct order mandate. In a direct order mandate, the parent government will tell the subnational government, you must take this action under threat of either civil or criminal law, that there will be punitive measures if you do not take this action. So we do not have to incentivize this. We can just come right out and tell you, you must do this because we have the constitutional ability to tell you this is something that you have to do. Direct order mandates are used by Congress whenever Congress has the constitutional authority to tell a state or local government to take a certain type of action. Same type of thing at the state level. States will use direct order mandates whenever the state constitution provides them the power to tell a local government, you must take this specific action. The nice thing about direct order mandates is they are usually pretty clear cut. The downside of these direct order mandates is that, again, they're oftentimes not fully funded, which then impose a fiscal burden on state and local budgets. But that's your first type of mandate, an order, a direct order type of mandate. Second category of mandates are what are called cross-cutting mandates. And they're called cross-cutting mandates because they are orders that cut across several different policy areas. So a classic example of a cross-cutting mandate is anti-discrimination. So you may not discriminate in the areas of voting. You may not discriminate in the areas of housing, in the areas of education, in the areas of employment. It cuts across all of those different policy areas, hence the reason why it's referred to as a cross-cutting type of mandate. And again, anti-discrimination laws are the perfect examples of cross-cutting types of mandates. The third type of mandate is what's called a crossover mandate. And crossover mandates are oftentimes seen by state and local governments as perhaps the most insidious type of mandate that there is. In a crossover mandate, Congress or the executive branch will use a crossover mandate when it does not have the constitutional ability to tell a state or local government to take a certain type of action in a program or a policy area. So what the national government will do is it will say, states, we want you to take this specific action. If you do not take this action we want you to do, then we're going to withhold funding from you in a related area. So an example, um, a very classic example was the Highway Beautification Act from back in the 1950s and then reauthorized in the 1960s. The purpose of the Highway Beautification Act was to try and require states to clean up their highways and get rid of all these billboards on the highways. And so it required that state governments would have to locate billboards a certain number of feet away from the road to make it safer and to make it more aesthetically pleasing. And Congress could not tell state governments that they had to do that. But what they would say is, if you do not do that, we will remove road construction money from you. We'll take federal road construction money away from you until you come into compliance with the requirements of the Highway Beautification Act. Congress did the same type of thing several years later with a national speed limit. So the federal government wanted to see a 55 mile per hour national speed limit. 
different states had different speed limits. Some states were 65, some were 70, some were 75, some didn't have speed limits. Congress wanted every state to abide by a 55 mile per hour national speed limit. So they told states, until you adopt a 55 mile per hour speed limit, we are going to take highway funds, federal highway funds away from you, what were known as ICE-T funds, and take those funds away from you until you reduce your, or you pass the state law to reduce your speed limit to 55 miles per hour. States like Pennsylvania literally lost hundreds of millions of dollars in federal highway funds because they refused, just flat out refused, to adopt a law reducing their speed limit to 55 miles per hour. A little bit more recently in the Clinton administration, the Clinton administration was very interested in having a national blood alcohol content limit of 0.08%. And so they wanted every single state to adopt a 0.08 blood alcohol content level. Different states had different back levels. Some states had 0.10, some had 0.12. Clinton administration wanted everyone to be at 0.08. Until a state adopted a 0.08 blood alcohol content level, we would then remove, or the federal government would then remove highway funds from those states. And it was successful in that brought all states into compliance with that 0.08 blood alcohol content level. It's called a crossover mandate because again, it crosses over from one policy area to a related policy area. You don't do what we want you to do over here. We're then gonna take money away from you over here. Again, very much of that, that stick type of an approach. Then the fourth type of mandate is what's known as a preemptive mandate. Preemptive mandates come in a couple of different varieties. There can be partially preemptive mandates and then there can be fully preemptive mandates. In a preemptive mandate, the national government will come in and tell a state or local government, you no longer have the legal right to make a decision in this given policy area, that you can no longer pass a law in this policy area. We are preempting your ability to have your own state law or your own state approach. In a fully preemptive type of mandate, that's what Congress will do. They'll come in and say, you can no longer have this type of law. And so an example of that was with internet taxation. So many years ago, Several states, 10 of them actually, had what they called internet access taxes. Internet access taxes were taxes that the state would charge to consumers for gaining access to the internet. So every month, your internet service provider would provide you with access to the internet and would then charge you a fee for that access to the internet, and the state would then tax that fee that you are paying. That was an internet access tax. Congress decided it no longer wanted to see any states have internet access taxes. And as of January 1st, I believe it was 2007, Congress said there can be no more internet access taxes. We are fully preempting the right of state governments to levy internet access taxes. So that's an example of a fully preemptive type of mandate. Remove that revenue source completely away from state governments. The much more common type of preemptive mandate is what's called a partially preemptive mandate. And partially preemptive mandates, those are what we see commonly in environmental laws, environmental protection. So in a partially preemptive mandate, the federal government will come in and will say, you have to adopt this federal minimum standard. So here is the national minimum standard for water quality. Here is the national minimum standard for air quality you must at least have standards as strict as the national air and water quality standards. So you are preempted from having a state standard that is less strict and less stringent than the national minimum standard. However, if you wanna go above that national minimum standard and be stricter, you have the freedom to do so. So here in California, we went above the national water quality standard. We went above the national air quality standard. And you can do that as a state, as long as you are at least as restrictive as a national standard, you can then be more restrictive if you would like. So states are fully preempted from having laws that are less strict than the national law, but they are free to then pass laws that are more strict than the national law. And that's what's called a partially preemptive type of mandate. Mandates have direct relevance to fiscal relations, 
when we are looking at how those mandates are being funded. And back in 1995, the states were successful at getting together and putting forth this act known as the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. In 1995, the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act was passed by Congress, thus requiring that Congress, if the financial impact of a law that they were considering exceeded a certain, certain threshold amount, then they would have to start providing funding for that mandate. And so the way in which the act would work is that if there was a new law that was being considered by Congress, if one member of the House or the Senate stood up to a point of order and said, point of order, Mr. Speaker, this law is subject to the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, then Congress would have to send that law to get a fiscal scoring, what's what we call it, get a fiscal estimate of how much that law would cost state and local governments. And if that law cost over would cost over a certain threshold amount, then the federal government would be obligated to at least partially fund that law. It was much more of a rhetorical victory for state and local governments than it was a practical one in that the way the law was written, in order for the Unfunded Mandates Act to go into effect, a member of Congress would have to rise to a point of order and kind of point out that this is affected by the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. If no member of Congress rose to a point of order, then the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act would not go into effect. So Congress could just decide, we're not going to burden ourselves with the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. And if all members agree, then the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act is not triggered. Another problem with the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act is it was passed in 1995, but it only affected mandates from 1995 onward. It did not affect mandates that were passed prior to 1995. So all those costs that were burdening down state and local governments from laws prior to 1995, those laws were then not affected by this Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. So it's a very rhetorical victory for state and local governments, but the practical effect is Congress can still pass and will still pass unfunded and partially funded mandates on state and local governments. In much the same way that state governments still pass on unfunded and partially funded mandates onto their local governments as well. Here in California, we had our own unfunded mandates reform act known as Proposition 1A, and there are a bunch of Proposition 1As. We tend to reuse proposition numbers in California just to confuse everybody. But this was one of the types of Proposition 1As that, again, limited the ability of the state government to issue unfunded or partially funded mandates on local governments unless it was overridden by the gov governor or by the state legislature. So the state gave itself a loophole that you could drive a truck through, that the state decided either the governor or the state legislature decided this is an emergency situation. Uh, it would then allow the state to go ahead and promulgate this unfunded or partially funded mandate and pass that financial burden down to local governments. So the reality is, despite all these attempts to try and stop unfunded and partially funded mandates, unfunded and partially funded mandates are still a sad reality for most state and local governments. And even though state governments complain all the time about federal unfunded mandates, it doesn't stop the state from promulgating state unfunded mandates and passing that burden on down to their local governments. So whenever we have partial funding or unfunded mandates, that's where we're gonna have the profound impact upon the amount of revenue that local governments have at their disposal. As you looked at your local city, I'm sure you looked at the revenue portfolio diversity of your city, and you probably saw that there was a component of intergovernmental grants. Intergovernmental revenue tends to be a relatively small part of a lot of cities and counties. It's a much larger part for special purpose governments such as school districts. And school districts tend to get a good bit of their unrestricted general fund money coming in from uh, grants from the state of California. So the reliance upon intergovernmental grants really will depend upon the type of government that you are looking at. General purpose governments are less reliant. Special purpose governments tend to be more reliant. The more reliant you are on intergovernmental grants, the more subject you are to changes in the economy and the more um, susceptible you are in poor fiscal times. 
The author of our textbook, John Mikesell, in addition to writing that textbook, he wrote a lot of other books as well. Uh, one of his famous books was called City Finances, City Futures. And the basic moral of the story that Mike Sell tells us is governments are best able to weather poor economic times when they are able to diversify their revenue portfolio. Governments that are too reliant upon one source of revenue, especially a source of revenue beyond their control, like intergovernmental revenue, those are the governments that will have more trouble in poor fiscal times. The more you can rely upon own source revenue, the more control you have on your revenue flows. So intergovernmental revenue can be seen as a good addition for a lot of local governments, but it should never end up being your primary source that you're surviving on because it is very transient. It is very unpredictable. We just want to talk about intergovernmental uh, fiscal relations in terms of Intergovernmental revenue is another piece of the pie. So governments generate their money from taxes. They generate their money from non-tax sources, such as user fees and user charges. And then they also generate a smaller amount of revenue from intergovernmental revenue. So that then concludes all the topics that we typically cover here in the budgeting course. So I thought in a few minutes, if we can go through kind of a course conclusion, kind of go back and revisit some of the major topics that I hope you can take with you from this course that will not only help you in doing the budgeting case study in 697, but hopefully also help you in your organization's better understanding how budgets are created and how budgets are analyzed and managed. So some of the important concepts that we've covered over the past six weeks, obviously the definition of budget. Uh, I hope that you now have a good working knowledge of what a budget is, the significance of considering a budget as a statement of priorities, as opposed to just a statement of projected revenue for the next fiscal year. Budgets can really be used for a lot of different purposes. They can be used to help plan the operations of our organizations. They can help to manage the operations of our organizations. They can also help to control the amount of money that we are spending in our organizations as well. So money is really the lifeblood of all public organizations. And how we manage that money will be dictated by how good of a job we do constructing and analyzing our budgets. We also spent time this term talking about budget processes. When we talked about the four main phases in the budget process, preparation, formulation, implementation, and evaluation. And we talked about how those four different phases work at the national level, as well as how those four different phases work here in the state of California. Uh, all budget formats typically follow those four different phases. Some states are much more an executive dominated process like the federal level. Some states tend to have more of a legislatively dominated process. As we talked about here in California, we tend to be an executive dominated budget process. We talked about the timetable here in California, and we also talked about some of the, um, some of the difficulties we have in terms of the trailer bill process. In that here in California, we use trailer bills which means that we oftentimes when the budget is passed, local governments don't really have guidance in terms of how that money is supposed to be spent until they then get that trailer bill passed sometimes one or two or three months after that budget passes and gets signed by the governor. But you should have a working familiarity with the basics of how budget processes work. We also spent time talking about the four main types of budget formats, line item performance program and zero based budgets. Uh, you had the opportunity in your post-instructional assignment to look at your budget and place it into one of those four categories. Hopefully, you are able to look at a budget and know which type of budget format that budget reflects, and then also be able to understand what the advantages and disadvantages of each of those budget formats are so that you will know if your organization is using the appropriate budget format for their purposes. Do they want to use the budget format to control their spending, to manage their operations? to plan their operations as an organization. We spent a week talking about budget analysis, and we talked about how we analyze budgets and why we analyze budgets. We went through some of the analytical techniques we can use. We want to forecast revenue and estimate expenditures. We talked about the importance of a break-even analysis and went through an example of a break-even analysis. 
we talked about cost benefit analysis and the creation of benefit cost ratios and how that process works and some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages of that type of a process. We spent a good bit of time talking about fiscal solvency and you had the chance to use Brown's 10 point indicators and you had a chance to use Wang 2 and Dennis's 10 indicators in order to assess the fiscal solvency of your city. And fiscal solvency is about more than just did revenues exceed expenditures in one given fiscal year. And there are other ways, more nuanced ways that we can assess the fiscal solvency of a city. So I hope based upon this information, you can look at your organization's budget or look at your city's budget and be able to come to at least a preliminary conclusion about how fiscally solvent that government is. Uh, obviously, if you're going to do this in real life, you would have to go out there and look at comparative governments and make those comparisons. But at least you have a general working knowledge of the types of indicators that are used for fiscal solvency. We spent time talking a little bit of time talking about accounting. And we talked about the basics of governmental accounting, things like fund-based accounting and the differences between different types of funds. We talked about accrual-based accounting versus cash-based accounting. Some basic principles such as double entry accounting. So you at least have kind of a working knowledge of how accounting works in governmental organizations. We also then spent a week talking about capital budgeting. We talked about how we put together a capital budget, how we put together capital improvement plans. We talked about the tools that we use to then compare capital projects to determine which capital projects to include in our capital budget, which projects do not get included in our capital budget. And then we spent time talking about how we pay for those capital projects. We talked about the different types of debt, both long-term as well as short-term debt, bonds versus notes. We talked about the process of issuing bonds and how that process works, and the steps you go through in issuing bonds, and advantages and disadvantages of different types of bonds like you talked about in Canvas essay number four. Then last week, we talked about taxation, tax sources of revenue, we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of property, income, and sales taxes. We talked about the mechanics of how property, income, and sales taxes work. We also talked about some limitations that have been placed upon the ability of, of governments to generate money from property, income, and sales taxes. We then talked about the pronounced movement here in California of local governments moving away from a reliance upon property taxes and supplanting some of that property tax revenue with revenue from user fees and user charges. And we talked about some of the necessary conditions that you need in order to utilize a user charge. We talked about the, um, the basic theoretical differences between user charges and user fees. Uh, then we talked about um, intergovernmental fiscal relations tonight. We talked about intergovernmental grants as just another tool that can be used uh, in addition to your tax revenue, another type of non-tax revenue uh, money coming in from, from parent governments. On a bigger scale, we also talked very early on this term about why we have budgets to begin with and why we have public expenditures. And we talked about the differences between different types of goods, public goods versus private goods versus toll goods versus common pool goods. And knowing what type of good we are dealing with and how we define that good will then help dictate whether or not that is good that should be provided and produced by government. We talked about the difference between provision and production. We talked about how that difference between provision and production relates to the idea of privatization and how privatization can then reduce the scope of our public budgets and reduce the number of product, number of, of goods that we consider to be purely public goods in nature. So kind of like kind of overarching look at why we have public budgets to begin with and why public expenditures even exist. Kind of that difference between what we do here in a public budgeting class compared to what they might do over in the College of Business. So those are the primary topics that we've covered over the past six weeks. I know we have done it relatively quickly because that's the nature of a beast in a summer class. We only have six weeks to go through all that information. But I think the way in which the class has been structured has prepared you well to then be successful on your budgeting case study in 697. Um, the budgeting case study is, I, to my knowledge, has not yet been created for the next academic year. So if you're taking 697 in the upcoming academic year, the 23-24 academic year, uh, I'm assuming that that case study will probably be provided sometime in late August. 
Uh, but usually in that case, uh, you'll have the requirement to put together a, a budget using Excel based upon some type of exercise that Dr. Zhao will be providing for you. Uh, so I think that you have the experience here to put that budget together working from an exercise and that should then serve you well once you get to 697. And that is the entire show for public budgeting. Do you have any basic questions about intergovernmental fiscal relations or really any of these topics that we have talked about here in our review of what we have covered so far this semester? Uh, Dr. Powell, I do have a question relating to uh, community block grants. So mm -hmm. in your explanation of, of a grant, particularly the block grant you had, the project base and then the formula base. So in my line of work, we use community development block grant CDBGs to help fund uh, projects more specifically and usually in parks, whether it's uh, facilities, uh, up, upkeeping maintenance or even improvements. So is that is that an example of that? Would it fall into that project base? Yeah, and, and it's kind of a variation of project base in that Oftentimes with some CDBJs, you can, if it's, if it's something that, that you have a need for, the project and the proposal that you're writing is not, it's not quite as competitive of a process with that proposal because the funding is, is kind of spread out more equally in a more egalitarian manner across a lot of different governments. It is technically a project base, but it's not the same level of competition that you would have with a, a more specific type of project-based grant. But I think you could put it in the project-based type of category. Yeah, thank you. And then under mandates, I know that we've had a situation where we were looking into applying for improvement of tennis courts, but in the, I imagine it was mandates in the in language, it stated that um, we needed to essentially promise that we were gonna do the improvement to the tennis courts and maintain those tennis courts throughout like a 10 year course so that the money wasn't necessarily used for something else. Um, so that I would imagine that would fall under the mandates. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're, and you're being told you have to do this with this money and you have to do this with this money over this 10 year period of time. And so, you know, there are gonna be ancillary costs as well when you have to maintain these courts over a 10 year period of time. You know, then the other question is, you know, does those maintenance costs then start to bleed over into other revenue from, from the city? And so, you know, will this grant be sufficient enough in order to pay for these maintenance costs over that 10 year period of time? Or if those maintenance costs end up exceeding the amount of money you're getting in grants, it's going to bleed over into maybe your general fund and then you're going to have to pay for it out of your general fund. That's a common problem for a lot of local governments. I know that in the area of education, uh, we have at the local school district level, we have what was called the um, it's not a great term, but it's called the special education bleed in that the amount of federal money that was coming in for special education programs was not sufficient to pay for all the special education programs that you are legally required to, to offer. And so you may have the federal grant money covering perhaps 20 or 25 percent of your special education costs, but you are then legally mandated to provide these programs to students who then meet the eligibility requirements. And so 70 to 75% of those costs are then going to be borne by the local school district. And that then bleeds over into general fund dollars and allow the general fund dollars that would normally be going elsewhere then have to be redirected to pay for the amount of special education funding that's not being reimbursed by, by the federal government. You know, sometimes when you have those types of programs, they, even though you're getting federal money, receiving that federal money actually costs you more because you're being required to carry out these programs and pay for them with your own source revenue. And so sometimes it, even getting this grant money uh, actually financially hurts you uh, as, a, as a government. So I think that's kind of, a, kind of a similar type of situation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah, no, well, those are, those are great examples and great questions. Uh, any other? Questions or observations or clarifications on any of this information? I had a question, Dr. Powell. Sure. Is um, so the agency that I work talks about um, RFPs a lot. Is that is that different from um, competing for a grant through the project proposals? 
RFP, that's, that it's, it's a term that's thrown out uh, around a lot for a lot of different things. It's a request for a proposal. So yes, if it's a mm -hmm. project-based type of grant, yes, you'll get a request for proposals. And then the, the proposal that you then put together is in response to that RFP. So yes, RFPs can be used to solicit proposals for project-based grants. That's very common. RFPs can be used in the competitive bidding process to request bids from contractors uh, for construction projects. But yeah, an RFP is just a request for proposals. Thank you. Sure. Good. Okay, um, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm gonna be around for a while. So if you have any other questions that occur to you about any of the information that we've covered in this class, you can always reach me by email. So shoot me an email, I'm happy to answer any of those questions. If you have any questions at all about the final assessment as you are working on that or the remainder of this week, again, feel free to send me an email. Again, try and be as parsimonious and concise with your answers as you can be. The final assessment then is due by midnight on Friday and then Canvas essay number five and two responses due by midnight on Friday as well. All righty. Okay, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. I know I apologize. Everything we went through, we went through very quickly, but I'll give you back the rest of the time tonight so you can work on your Canvas essay number five as well as your final assessment. So thank you very much. Pleasure working with everyone and um, hope you have a great remainder of your summer. So take care. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Dr. much. Powell, um, I had one more question. Sorry if you're still there. Sure. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I just quick question. I, I wanted to get your kind of your expertise on this. So I I work for the city of Los Alamitos and we um we're trying to look at our future for City Hall. And mm -hmm. it's it's quite the puzzle because I'm not sure if there are opportunities where like a bond would be a realistic approach. Um and I've seen in other cities they do some sort of like private public partnerships. And that seems to be kind of the direction that we're looking into. Do you have any experience on that? Not a lot of experience in private public partnerships. Um, I do have experience in bonds, issuing bonds. Um, you know, my school district went through that uh, on a couple of the different occasions and refunding bonds. In terms of public private, not a whole lot of experience with that. Um, okay. You know, who may have a little bit more experience with that would be um, Dr. Zhao. Um, she's taking over as the budgeting guru, if you will, for the department. I know okay. in her work at UIC, she's done some work in public-private partnerships. And so uh, she might be a good person to reach out to. It's Tina Zhao, and um, okay. she's our, our new budgeting faculty member. So she might have some expertise in that area. Got it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I just figured I'd ask. Sure. Yeah. All right. Take care. All right. Have a good night. See you soon. All right. Bye.